Welcome. This is the first part of a series of small lectures on the construction of hyperreal numbers. For the moment, I am mostly following the book of Robert Goldblatt. I am also going to use notes found on the blog of my colleague Rob Lowe, which is full of excellent material. I will keep on advising on giving you references as we progress. There are two ways to introduce the field of hyperreal numbers that we write star r. The first is axiomatic and the second is constructive. Our problem is mostly the lack of familiarity and intuition with the hyperreal numbers, which may often make you feel that an axiomatic definition of the hyperreal is an exercise of fantasy. And you quickly come to question the existence of star r. The constructive approach, on the other hand, really brings the hyperreal numbers to life. And eventually, you reach a point when you are as convinced of the hyperreal's existence as you are of the existence of real numbers. Of course, when you introduce new numbers, we need to introduce new notations. Starting from the integers, when we either construct or define the negative numbers, we need to introduce new notation, which simply consists of putting a minus in front of an integer. When we define the rational number, here too, we have to introduce a new notation. It can be explicit by writing p over q, where p and q are both integers, or more abstract if you choose to write r is an element of q. The same is true for real numbers. You can have an explicit notation or an abstract notation. When you write pi, for example, there is, no, there is nothing telling you here that what is the value of pi. However, you know various properties of this number, which allows you to manipulate it and deal with it when it appears in your equations. The same is going to be true for hyperreals. Here too, we are going to need new notations. It can be abstract, and often an infinitesimal will be written eta or epsilon, while infinitely big numbers will be capital N or capital M. But it is good to know that the construction of hyperreals also allows us to come up with a more explicit representation of hyperreal numbers. In some ways, we already have intuition about epsilon, an infinitely small. An epsilon, an infinitesimal, is a number between 0 and 1 over n for all n integers. I should have said a non-zero infinitesimal as we insist that epsilon is larger than 0. It is clear that there is no such thing, so no such number in R. If epsilon exists, it is part of something bigger, we call it star R. The question is how to build this, this star R and what is it? Here, we are going to see what is the general strategy for the construction of hyperreal number. And in fact, all the steps of these constructions are similar to the steps of, that you need in the construction of real number starting from the rational number. And this is what we are going to do right now. Step one, we need to construct a bigger set, the set of all Cauchy sequences with elements in Q. A given element of this set is a sequence, like you see here, and I'm going to write S, the set of all Cauchy sequences. If you do not remember what is a Cauchy sequence, it is a sequence for which the statement here is true. Now, you probably know already that all Cauchy sequences converge towards a real number, but at this point, we have not yet constructed the real numbers, so all I can say is that some of the Cauchy sequence we are dealing with here are converging towards rational numbers and others are not. Step two, it is to define addition and multiplication between elements of S. Addition of two sequences is simply defined by adding two elements um, of the sequence. And the same is true here for the multiplication. We also need to verify that S is closed under this operation. Uh, in other words, that 
a plus b and a times b are also Cauchy sequences. Step 3 is to define an equivalence relation so that the sequences a and b are equivalent if and only if the sequence a minus b converges to zero. We need to check, of course, that this definition meets the condition which define an equivalence relation. The relation needs to be reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. I will let you make sure that those properties are satisfied. Now that this is done, we can, <coughs> we can define an equivalence relation. The equivalence class of A are all the elements B, which are Cauchy sequences, equivalent to A. If we look here, you see that S is divided in partitions. Each partition is an equivalence class. This here is the equivalence class of A. And here are elements equivalent to A. One of them, this one, is, is A itself. Step four is now to verify consistency or compatibility between addition and multiplication and the equivalence relation. In other words, we need to check that if small gamma is equivalent to capital gamma and if small lambda is equivalent to capital lambda, then omega plus small omega plus small lambda is equivalent to capital omega plus capital lambda, and the same should be true here for multiplication. Once again, I'm going to leave this to you. It is now time to define the partition of S or the set of equivalence classes. I notice I put a 2 here. There is no 2, it's a mistake. Now, step six, step 6, we can safely define addition and multiplication on the partition of S. The sum and the product of two equivalence classes are defined here. In other words, the composition of two equivalence classes is defined by the equivalence class of the composition of two elements of each class. Finally, step seven, we can identify some particular elements of the partition, two elements of Q. Let me define here Q between square bracket as the equivalence class of all the omegas which are Cauchy sequences, which are equivalent to the constant sequence Q, 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 where Q here is a um, rational number. Of course, the product and the sum of two constant sequences are constant sequences. I can now define the set P of all those particular sequence. And um, we should note that this is a subset of the set of partitions. I also define a function f from p to q uh, as defined here. We can verify that f is an isomorphism between p and q. It means that it satisfies the two relations that are here that does define f as a homomorphism. We also see that f is bijective and a bijective homomorphism is an isomorphism. In other words, this is telling us that all the elements of P behave exactly the same way the rational number do. And F is a mapping that allows us to go from one set to the other. Here we have the partition of S and the particular elements that we have isolated in the set P, which are mapping P as a function F to the rational numbers. But we have other elements as well in the partition, which are not in the set P. And we can conclude that just like P, Q is part of a bigger set. Those are the real numbers. OK, but that's not good enough. Um, and in order to be able to state that the Cauchy sequences can be used to construct the real numbers, we need an order relation that will allow us to say when one Cauchy sequence is bigger than another. 
are smaller than the norm. So we can say that the equivalent class of the Cauchy sequence B is larger than the Cauchy sequence, the equivalent class of the Cauchy sequence A, uh, where A and B are defined here, if and only if it exists an epsilon larger than zero, such that for n larger than capital N, a n plus epsilon is smaller than b n. We already knew, of course, that we had an order between rational numbers. And now we are able to find where those new numbers that we have just constructed fit. In other words, we are able to place all real numbers in the gaps between the rational numbers. The construction of hyperreal number will be very similar. We will start by creating a bigger set on which we define addition and multiplication. Step three is defining the equivalence relation. This is the most challenging part and will require us to investigate what are ultra filters. Then the following steps are a real walk in the park. We will finish by ad identifying some particular elements of the partitions, showing that they map on the real line. And the elements that will be left will be new numbers, the hyperreals. <laughs>